Podcasts of Crime Watch UK. Welcome back to a new series of Crime Watch UK as the programme begins its 10th year. We also have a new number, a free call number at last, and there's some news on several of the cases we covered before the summer break. First, uh, very briefly, because we can't say much, the murder of Rachel Nickell on Wimbledon Common. We had more calls from people trying to help in this case than we've ever had before. As you may know, a man has now been charged with Rachel's murder. On April's Crime Watch, police announced a detailed description of the man they believed had killed businesswoman Jean Bradley, who had been found stabbed beside her car in West London. Two people were able to draw police attention to one man, and one of those people was actually a Crime Watch producer who'd been out shopping and saw a familiar-looking person in the street. But the crucial evidence came two days after the programme, when a viewer went into his local police station in West London and gave officers a specific name. A man was subsequently arrested and is now in custody on a charge of murder. There have been some other arrests as well, and we'll try to make room to bring you some more news uh, later on. But first, a case that is still very much without a suspect. It's a crime, though, that everyone watching will badly want to solve, even and perhaps especially friends and relatives of the offender. The incidents we show took place on a Saturday, the last Saturday of July in Darlington. Both victims in our reconstruction are played by actresses, and deliberately, neither actress resembles the woman she portrays. I left school last summer, and I decided to move back into Darlington, where I was brought up. And I got a job as a hairdresser, which is what I've always wanted to do. When I got the job, I was in love the moon. At the same time, about two o'clock that Saturday, on the other side of Darlington, a squash game was underway. We enjoy playing squash, although I wouldn't describe it as good. We just really enjoy playing it. We've been playing squash for about half an hour when we realised we were being Go. watched. Again. At first, I didn't oh. think anything of it. Just assumed he was waiting to go on court. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm being watched. But after a while, he started putting us off, making us feel awkward. Do you call it a day? Yeah, OK. I'm getting the lobby. Right. Yeah, OK. On the way to the changing rooms, I had to pass him on the stairs. I just wanted to quickly get past him so there was no eye contact. I was looking forward to going home that day because I'd been on my feet all day. Are you doing yeah, it is. I think we'll just finish tidying up and then we'll go home, shall we? Oh, that's great. It was really tiring day, even though it wasn't busy. When I saw him standing there, I just froze. I, I was really shocked. I didn't know for sure whether or not he'd left the changing rooms. I was really scared when I was looking around, because there were so many places he could be. The barman at the Dolphin Centre saw him next. I was watching TV in the bar. The football was on the television. I thought he wanted serving because he was rummaging around in his bag, maybe he's putting money or something. I would have thought he was about mid-twenties, late-twenties. He was about 5'8", tall, very stocky, thick-set man. He had a round face, hard in appearance. Excuse me, do you work here? I do, yes. There was a man in here a minute ago, and he was staring at me. Are you OK? Oh, yeah, but Just... he really frightened me. I need a control. Will you proceed to the Dolphin Leisure Centre in the market today? Report of an incident in the ladies' changing room. Roger, Dalton Leisure Centre, en route.
It's now about three in the afternoon. I was just sat on the bus, not taking a care in the world, just staring out the window and didn't really notice who was on or what was going on. I was just in the world of my own. Hello. Are you Karen? Yes, I am. I've heard about your complaint. What I'm wanting to know is he's still here. Um, well, I don't know. I, I doubt it. My boyfriend's looking at the moment, but um, he ran off pretty quickly, so I would imagine he's gone. Got off at Nation Road. I thought, oh, I'll have a ride up the riding schools, because I used to do it when I was younger. I thought to myself, I'll have a walk up there. Got about halfway up the lane, and this man came out from the hedge, and it made me a bit on edge. So I just started to walk a little bit faster. Hi. Could you tell me where the riding stables are, please? Um, you've actually missed the turning. It's back on yourself and first on the left. OK, thanks. Bye. Bye. This man that was following me passed me, and he looked as if he was going to say hello, but he didn't. So I didn't think much of it. Hiya, can I help you? Hi. Can you tell us how much the lessons are, please? Uh, the six pounds an hour. Do I have to book in advance, or can I just come along? It's best if you book. Okay, All right. Thanks. See you Bye. later. Now. Bye. I turned back round and walk down Snipe Lane. It was about ten minutes later. I checked all the horses and everything, and then I got my bike, and I started going up the lane. There was a man in the field, and he was acting quite strange. I thought he was a horse weedor, you know, like with the horses being slashed in that round here. Kept my eye on him all the way across the field. He just didn't walk. He, like, he was full of hell as he walked across the field. I thought about going down having a word, but normally when people are in the field, like, you can go down and you just get a whole load of abuse. I thought, well, is it worth it? So I just turned off and went to my friends. It keeps haunting me, because I think I should have gone down. If I had gone down, maybe I could have stopped it from happening. He held a knife to my throat. He dragged me behind the hedge. I kicked him and tried to go away, but I couldn't get past him. He threw me to the ground. I was lying on the floor, crying my eyes out. When he had his hands around my throat, I thought, oh, God, I'm going to die, this is it. Her injuries were so severe that he almost killed her. Such force was applied to her throat that she was all but strangled. She had the signs of strangulation across her neck and over her face, and those are the minute hemorrhages that covered her entire face and her entire throat. So this young woman is very lucky to be alive. I would ask the public to respond very positively. This is a, a, a dangerous man, and I'm very concerned that he will go out and repeat this sort of episode, and next time the young woman won't be so lucky. Well, I told you that uh, everybody, relative to the offender, would be anxious to catch this man and it looks like you're likely to tonight, if not very soon. This is the most remarkable clue, Mr. Ryan. Just come into your possession. Tell that's, us about it. That's right. Within um, the last 48 hours, we've found this particular shirt, which has been identified by the victim as that worn by the attacker. Now, this was concealed in the field and very difficult to find until the crops were, were that's taken. That's correct. In. The crops have only just recently been cut, and as a result of that, um, this shirt was found concealed in that field. And it's very rare. It's very distinctive. It's uh, a specific goalkeeper's shirt. Um, it's made by the manufacturer's son, Deco, who specifically make sportswear, in particular goalkeeper's kit. You can see the one there, which says son Deco, and you can see the mud here where the attacker fell off the fence. That's right. That's what I believe that is. Now, there can't many, be many of these around in Darlington. That's right. This particular shirt was made for the 1991-92 season. It's no longer in manufacture, it's no longer in stock, and in fact, it's no longer sold. Um, as a result of that, by looking at the shirt, we can see it's a well-worn shirt, it's a well-used shirt. Um, it was used regularly before this guy lost it. Or there is no it. doubt about that. And somebody, either a mother, wife, girlfriend, somebody who's used to washing that shirt, hasn't washed it lately. In addition to that, Perhaps somebody who normally plays football for a local team 
hasn't turned up in his usual shirt. That's a very well-worn, well-loved shirt. It's hard to think the worst of your teammate, let alone your, your son, your brother, close friend, whatever. Just to help people put that picture together, the jigsaw puzzle, give us the best description you've got of him. We're talking here about a, a young man in his late teens to mid-twenties, obviously sport orientated. He's some five foot six to five foot seven tall, well-tanned legs, muscular legs, who was prepared to commit a brutal rape um, in a ruthless fashion on a young girl who was 17 year old, a very naive young girl. He's done this at four o'clock in the middle of a Saturday afternoon without any apparent uh, concern for the consequences. As we heard from the police surgeon, he is a very dangerous man indeed. Please help us if you can. And here's the new number. Don't forget, uh, it's a free call as far as you're concerned. 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600. You can call Detector Inspector Ryan and other detectives live here at the studio. Or if you prefer, you can call their colleagues direct at the incident room. That's on 091 386 9011. 091, the code for Durham. 386-9011. Well, now, before we look at this month's photocall faces, an update on the results from our last photocall file. Two men were wanted in connection with the use of stolen credit cards in travel agents, among other places. They were identified by several viewers, and two arrests were made shortly after the program. One man is remanded in custody, charged with burglary and attempted deceptions. And a man recognised himself in security videos of robberies in two building societies in South and West England. Under arrest in Worthing for a separate offence, the man told police of his starring role on Crime Watch. He's now awaiting trial on a charge of robbery. And now here are Superintendent David Hatcher and DC Jackie Hames with this month's file of faces. This is Justin martin Clark. Hertfordshire police believe he can help them solve a murder. The victim, Paul Anthony Milburn, was shot dead in a drug deal that went wrong at Noak Lane, St Albans, on Monday the 26th of April. Justin martin Clark is 37, six foot tall, and has a slight Liverpool accent. He has connections in North London, Merseyside and Ireland, and may be using the names Martin Anthony Maher and Mark Meller or Michael Dwyer. If you know where he is, please don't approach him as he could be armed. Call us instead. Do you recognise these three people? On Wednesday the 4th of August, they mingled with holiday makers at Heathrow Airport, visiting various bureaux de change and banks inside the airport. Here they are using false passports to cash blank travellers' cheques which had been stolen the previous day. All three were very busy and cashed cheques to the value of £20,000 before later visiting Gatwick Airport and cashing more. The older man is around five foot eight, in his mid-fifties, heavily built with a pot belly and is wearing a dark wig. The other is in his early thirties, six foot with light brown hair. He's described as scruffy and wore a sleeper earring in his left ear. Could these two men be father and son? Finally, the woman of the trio is in her twenties, five foot six with long light brown hair. If you know these people or where they are now, please call. This is Peter Tobin. Hampshire police wish to talk to him after two schoolgirls were sexually assaulted and imprisoned in a flat in Havant. The teenage girls were allegedly kept in Tobin's home in Lee Park on the night of Wednesday 4th of August, where they were subjected to a serious sexual assault. The elder of the girls managed to escape the next morning. Later, police found the younger girl critically ill and she was rushed to intensive care at Queen Alexandra's Hospital. By midday, Tobin, a Scotsman, was 30 miles away walking towards Brighton Railway Station. It's known that he has contacts in Scotland, Sussex and Kent, but where is he now? He has a heart complaint, so he may have visited a chemist. If you have seen him, please call us tonight. And now to Sussex, where two weeks ago this man held up the staff at a building society in the quiet market town of Heathfield. He's rather distinctive looking and the sunglasses don't disguise his long, thin face and gaunt features. Armed with a handgun, he intimidated customers and staff and demanded money before walking out into the high street. We think he's in his late thirties, around five foot nine, and he spoke with a southern accent. Someone must recognise him. If you do, or if you know where he is, or you can help with any of our other photo call faces, please call us now. And here's our new free number again, 0500 600 600. If you can help on any of those cases, please do call 0500 600 600. Our next case is what the detective in charge of it describes as the most baffling he's ever tackled. In fact, apart from this teacup, there's almost nothing to go on. The cup, which uh, 
hasn't yet been washed, as you can see. Belonged to Harry and Meghan Twos, who probably took it off the shelf in honor of an unexpected visitor. Was that you, or do you know who it might have been? What does seem clear is that someone who went to see them on their farm that Monday morning did not reciprocate their friendship. Chiari Wine Farm nestles between undulating hills near the village of Flanharry, midway between Cardiff and Bridge End. Come on. Where are you, you little buggers? Come on. Come on. You may have known Harry Twos from his market garden business, though he retired some seven years ago. But he was still proud of his cabbages, which he guarded jealously from rabbits with his new shotgun. His old one had been stolen about a year ago. Breakfast time on Monday the 26th of July. Is that all right, then? Lovely, thank you, lovely. This is quite a tangled web, isn't it? You could remind us. Have you finished your list yet? Almost. That should last us for a few days. What sort of meat do you want? I don't know. To ratify a European pork would be nice. Oh, what was that we had the other week? Uh, lamb, was it? Roast lamb. Get that to me. Must get down to that cattle market again. It's time we had a few more head. Keep the place going like. Well, I'm glad we got that hay in. That'll keep us going for a while. It will, then. Harry and Megan were both born in mid Glamorgan, and their little farm had been in Megan's family for a century and more. Their only daughter moved away seven years ago, and life was uneventful. Got your purse and everything? Yes, your... we won't be wanting very much, and we got our pension money. Back at lunchtime, then. What little's known about that fateful day is this. At 9.30 a.m., Harry and Megan left the farm and drove up their narrow, churned-up track to fetch their pensions from the post office at Clan Harry. Morning. How are you today? Fine, thank you. Is your wife here today? Yes, uh, just outside, Meg. Here you are, Meg. Fill your pockets with that lot. Out of our pockets into Tesco's, more like. Not too busy in there this morning. No, get you early enough, see. Uh, Monday's always a busy day. Anything in the paper then? No, nothing changes. World still in a mess. Ivy's coming back soon. Who's that? Ivy, Ivy Brennan from Coronation Street. Oh, that's rubbish. You're always on about that programme. She's good, though. I like Ivy. I shouldn't be too long. I haven't got very much to get. They'd shopped here almost every Monday for 15 years and sometimes bumped into one of Harry's sisters. Hello, Harry. Oh, hello, love. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. How are you feeling after your operation? Oh, not bad. Uh, still a bit sore. We met them at Tesco's and we had a little chat about the family. Megan liked their chat. And Harry had been involved in the farmers because he was on the committee. They were very quiet couple and they were a devoted couple. According to a neighbour, by about 11, the couple were arriving back at the farm. 
I was going to visit my sister. I seen Harry and Meghan choose his Land Rover. They then turned in over the cattle grid and then went towards their home. Where do you want this one? In the cupboard under there. Local people had thought nothing of the two gunshots that Monday lunchtime. Maybe Harry had been out rabbiting again. But that evening, when their daughter's nightly phone call went unanswered, neighbours were alerted. Eventually, police were called, and Harry and Meghan were discovered in the cowshed, buried under hay. There were no signs of a robbery, and it seems likely they knew their killer. Do you think you know who it was? or why someone might want them dead. Harry and Meghan had been shot. That was a necessarily impressionistic account because, of course, so little is known about that day. And, as I said, this is really the best clue. You're pretty sure that this was taken down the shelf, from the shelf very, very rarely, and only when there was an important visitor. That's correct. Uh, we can't rule out the fact that Mrs. Tools herself may have drunk from the cup that, that morning. The indications are that she didn't. But she uh, never normally did? No, her favourite mug was in the kitchen. Uh, Mr. Tooth's mug was on the table alongside that cup and saucer. Now, let's get this clear. This could have been an entirely innocent visitor that morning, who may be watching now and sort of horrified, saying, well, look, I just dropped in. Th that's, that's correct. It could have been, as you say, an innocent visitor, but we'd ask that person to come forward in order that we could eliminate him. Now, uh, what's the main point of your appeal? Because you have so little to go on. How can viewers help? Well, they can help, firstly, by uh, giving us any persons who they know who visit the farmhouse. It is important. Um, we haven't come across all that many people that actually went to the farmhouse. Do you need to know everybody who knew Harry and Meghan? Very much so, yes. It would help to give us a, a background on Mr and Mrs Tools, which would obviously be great assistance to us. Now, what about anybody who's heard rumours, even vague? Are they any good to you, or do you need concrete evidence? Yes, however vague these rumours may be, then we would like to hear them. As I say, despite extensive inquiries, no apparent motive has emerged as yet. So anybody who's been talking about anything that could be connected to Anything this? at all, field, grudge, whatever. Now, I know you've also got to eliminate some cars and some people seen in the area on the day. Tell us about them and the area involved. Yes, uh, comparatively speaking, the farmhouse in question is um, in a somewhat isolated area. And I'm particularly keen for pedestrians or motorists that were in the Tricastle Lane or the old Flanharry Flanharan Lane area to come forward. Those are marked in orange on the map. Then remember, it's Monday the 26th of July. Very briefly, this is a, a replica of the gun that was stolen from Harry about a year ago, almost exactly uh, a year ago. Pretty distinctive. Now, obviously, whoever's stolen it is most unlikely to, to call in. Somebody might have repaired it, though, or know who's, who's got it now. Yes, it has some very unique fe features. Uh, firstly, the uh, underlever opener there. The, That's the this. Bottom, the yes. stock is broken by, yes. by this lever here. In fact, there was string attached to the trigger mechanism, similar to this gun in order to secure it in place. And a bit of damage to this. That's right. right hand the here. The right hand hammer mechanism was damaged. Short barrel, I know, two or three inches no off the, yes. the barrel. And it had, under here, this brass plate. It had uh, initials. initials. Yes, initials BJ were on the underside of the stock. OK, well, if you have any information, whatever it is, do please call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you can try the instant room in Cardiff. That's on 0222. 398381. That's 0222, the code for Cardiff, 398381. Well, the calls seem to be coming in thick and fast at the moment. We've had a lot of calls already on our first case, which was the attack on the young woman in Darlington. Several people have suggested names for the video fit for the attacker. Um, we've had a lot of calls on that shirt, the goalkeeper's shirt, but we do know the make. We know it's called Sondico, as we said, so please, we don't need any more calls confirming that. We just need to know who might have owned that goalkeeper's shirt. Um, three of our photo call cases now have got some quite good information coming in, but I'm not going to say anything more on that at the moment. But just to remind you that all those calls now are coming in on our new free phone number. That's 0500 600 600. And that's the number to ring now if you can help with any of our incident desk cases. Here again are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher.
First, detectives in Durham want to trace two men who attempted to rob a Group 4 security van at gunpoint on Tuesday the 10th of August. Two weeks before, these two men were seen posing as painters behind the Midland Bank in Peter Lee Town Centre. We believe they were planning their attack. On the day of the Group 4 delivery, one of the men, again posing as a painter, tried to snatch a money bag from the guards. The struggle took place and the robbers fled empty-handed in this stolen white Ford Sierra. It carried these copied number plates. Did you make them? The car was abandoned nearby. Inside were these two overalls with this distinctive red and some white paint on. Also, this unusual walking stick. It's made out of a billiard cue. Can you link these items to the two men who were both in their early 20s, about 5 foot 10, and wore those white painter's hats? The would-be robber had blonde hair which was shaved around the ears. His accomplice had short black hair and he spoke with a Cockney accent. If you can help at all, please ring the police in Peter Lee on 091 586 2621. That's 091, the code for Peter Lee, 586 2621. Still on Tyneside, colleagues are anxious to trace a man who kindly helped a young woman after, after she'd been indecently assaulted in the city centre this summer. We also want to identify the attacker, who's described as 5 foot 10, in his early 20s with short mousy hair. He had acne and a small white scar on the left side of his lip. At just after 1am on Sunday, July the 4th, the young woman attempted to get a taxi in front of the ritzy nightclub in Newbridge Street, Newcastle. Because there was a queue, she decided to head for a local taxi office and use the pedestrian walkway to cross over the motorway. It was 1.15am when she reached New Bridge Street West. As she was passing Joe Wilson's public house, she was pulled to the ground by a man who indecently assaulted her. The attacker was scared off by a passing car and ran towards the Central Business and Technology Park. The distressed woman was then helped by a motorist who drove her home in his black car. We want to talk to that driver who came to the woman's aid to see if he has any more information to offer or anyone else who might have seen the attacker. If you can help, please call the Newcastle Police on 091 232 3451. That's 091, the code for Newcastle, 3451. Officers from Birmingham need your help to solve the robbery on a milk delivery man during his collection rounds on the 17th of May. At about 6.30pm, he was leaving the Pelham supermarket on Alum Rock Road when he was approached by two men who threatened him at knife point. They forced him into the back of his car, a white Datsun Bluebird. The car was then driven along Alum Rock Road to a scrapyard where the man was locked in the boot. The thieves left with thousands of pounds in cash. They also took his LA Raiders jacket and we'd like to hear from anyone who might have seen it being dumped at a nearby canal bank. In the hall was over 500 pounds worth of milk tokens like these. Now, these can be used in any shop, so we'd like to hear from anyone who might have been offered a large quantity. Both robbers were Asian. The first is 18 to 20 years old, around 5 foot 10, stocky, with short black spiky hair. His accomplice is in his early 20s, 6 foot, slim, with rough skin. If you recognise this man, or can help in any way, please call West Midlands Police on 021 626 7111. That's 021, the code for Birmingham, 626 7111. Unusually, colleagues in France have asked for help on this next case, which involves the murder of a young Englishman. On March the 7th this year, the body of 27-year-old Anthony Howe was found on open ground next to a road 20 kilometres north of Paris. Tony, whose home was in Sheffield, had been brutally beaten. His passport, cash and holdall were all missing. Tony left England on Tuesday, February the 16th, on the North Sun Ferry from Hull to Rotterdam. He stayed at this hotel, the Ramona Bar. We know two Englishmen called Duane and Mark shared a room with him there on February the 17th. They had to return home suddenly because of a death in the family. Those young men probably don't even know Tony's dead, so if you're either Duane or Mark, please call because you may have vital information about Tony's movements. This anorak was found close to the body. We need to know if it was Tony's. So if you met him on his travels in February or can identify this jacket, please call South Yorkshire Police on 0742 523-340. That's 0742, the code for Sheffield, 523-340.
And finally, this man is one of a gang of armed robbers who viciously attacked post office employees in Cannock. On Monday the 16th of August, a man was seen in the driver's seat of this Bedford Astra van parked at the rear of the post office in Church Street. Perhaps you recognise him. He's in his 30s with dark short hair and possibly has two moles. He wore a dark blue baseball cap. Around 11.30, a mail van arrived at the rear of the post office. Three masked men armed with a shotgun and wooden stave leapt from the Astra. A particularly nasty attack, the robbers then sprayed ammonia into the faces of the terrified staff before escaping. The van was abandoned in the Beecroft Road car park. It had been stolen in Warrington a week before and had false plates C331OFT copied from a legitimate vehicle. We'd obviously like to hear from anyone who remembers making those plates. Although the raid took place in Cannock, it seems there's a Merseyside connection, as a Liverpool Echo newspaper was discovered in the van. The robbers left behind a pale green valance sheet, but took the owner's industrial Rotomeg drill, similar to this one. It has the serial number 1202. If you know anything, call the Staffordshire Police on 0785 234948. That's 0785, the code for Stafford, 234948. Alternatively, of course, you can call us here live at the studio, 0500 600 600. Easy to remember, and it's free wherever you are in the United Kingdom, direct to detectives here live in the studio, 0500 600 600. Well, finally, detectives from West Yorkshire are with us tonight in the hope that viewers can help their investigations into a robbery at a jewellery store in Halifax. The robbery took place 16 weeks ago, but both staff and customers in the shop at the time are still badly shaken by what happened. Our reconstruction begins a week before the robbery in the showroom of Bill Smith Motors in Liverpool, where two men were taking a particular interest in one bike and its number plate. All right, lads, can I help you? Good model, isn't it? Oh, why, under 600. Best model on the market at the moment. Two up. Yeah, it's got a... I remember the two men coming in the shop. They'd looked at all the bikes in the showroom, but they'd taken particular interest in the red Honda. I was surprised how young both of them were, really, considering the high-power bikes they were looking at. How much is it? Uh, on the road, 4,800. I noticed straight away one bike had a helmet with a black visor, which is illegal. Any good to you? You're interested? Yeah, I'm looking for something bigger than what I got. Um, what have you got at the moment? It's outside. Do you want to have a look? Yeah, I'll have a look, yeah. The one who did all the talking seems to know quite a lot about bikes. The second bike, I never said a word. I didn't even get a good look at him because he kept his helmet on all the time. What's the mileage? 20,000 kilometres. Kilometres? Is it yeah. on a cube plate? Yeah. I didn't know it was on a cube plate. Why is that like? Japanese import. Are you interested in part X in this against the one you were looking at in the shop? No, I was only just looking at that one. The salesman remembers the man was about 22 years old, about five foot nine, of medium build and with short black hair, possibly gelled back. He had a thin moustache. All right, all right. Thanks for coming in. Bye. Having spent about half an hour in the shop, the two men simply got on their bike and rode away. The day before, a bike very similar to the Honda the two men had been taking so much interest in had been stolen in Widnes. Good evening, police at Witness. Can I help you? I'd like to report my motorbike. It's been pinched from Genlab Car Park. At one o'clock that day, Stuart Callender had left his bike in his works car park in Tanhouse Lane. By 5.45, when he came to go home, it had gone. Can you tell me how much it's worth and give me a brief description of your bike? Yeah. It's a Honda CBR 1000 H632 BCA. Mr. Callender was able to give police a full description of his Honda Superbike. But by the time it was next seen by a builder near the Liverpool docks, one essential detail had been changed. The registration plate was now exactly the same as the Honda on sale in Billsmith Motors. I noticed the two lads early in the day tampering with uh, one of the park bikes. They had arrived on a red and black Honda CBR and the registration number was G27CKF. One of the lads appeared to be carrying a screwdriver and as they were acting suspiciously, I decided to ring the police. Listen, there's a couple of lads messing about with a motorbike down by the Port of Liverpool building. 
Yeah, well, I don't. I, they've been there for ages, not knocking about they with it. They've nicked that bike now. You better tell them to get down here quick. Right, now, they've, they've actually taken it now. One week later, it's the morning of Friday the 7th of May. Lister Horsfall jewellers in the Corn Market shopping precinct in Halifax were getting ready for the day's business as usual. Shall I let you out the chair? Ready? One, two, three, jump. Up. Yeah! I'll just finish putting these watches away, Vanessa. Will you see to those rings, love? Just put them in the window in the usual place, and then you can put that away yeah. afterwards if you yeah. would. One, two, three, and again! Clever. Clever. And again. Just check the security video jacket needs changing. As the time approached 10 o'clock, an off-duty store detective was out shopping with her parents, unaware that she was about to put into practice everything that she had learned about dealing with a robbery. That'll be all right now, Mrs. Evans. It's just a little bit of grit inside the mechanism, so... Get down! Get down! Get down! Get down, everybody! Get down! Customer, I can't. 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 The motorcyclists got away, leaving staff and customers, one of whom was 80 years old, in a state of shock. Yes. I would suppose the raid took in the region of 40 seconds, but it seemed like an hour and a half later. You, you've heard of these things happening, but you never think it's going to happen to you. And then it was something that, that was very frightening. At the top of Cheapside, the driver's disguise was dropped for a second. I just went into the bank. To bank some money, and then when I came out, I had a powerful motorbike coming up Cheapside. Uh, I thought it was a bit strange, and then he lifted his visor to see if there was anything coming. After he looked at me, put his visor down, and turned left on Commercial Street, heading towards Huddersfield. Jumping a red light at the junction of Commercial Street and Fountain Street, the getaway route stopped well short of Huddersfield. Whiskey Fox Trot 81 Control, just confirming the bike found behind Heath Grammar School, Golf 27. Charlie Kilo Foxtrot. The, the stolen bike, bike was discovered less than a mile away from the shopping precinct in Halifax. Correct. Correct. No one seems to have seen the men abandoning the bike, but eight miles further along the road, on the outskirts of Huddersfield, this man's attention was drawn by two men in a blue Vauxhall Astra. It's little more than half an hour since the robbery took place. There was two black men next to a car acting suspiciously. When I looked down behind the wall, I saw gloves and helmets. I thought it was strange for them to be dumping them behind the wall. As the man ran back with his daughter towards the fire, he just caught a glimpse of the two men driving off. Well, now, we've just heard, incidentally, if you know of anyone now who owns the Honda bike, which we saw at the start of the film, registration number G27CKF, don't call us. Now, that bike was legitimately sold from Bill Smith Motors in the last two weeks, so don't call us about the Honda bike G27CKF. That was the genuine article. But, Mr Peel, why did they go to the trouble in the first place of going into a showroom and copying a number plate? Should the motorcycle be seen on a routine check, it would uh, come up as um, a red and black Honda motorcycle. Which theirs was? That's right. So where do the two men come from, do you think? We feel that they come from the northwest with a Liverpool accent. However, we can't discount the fact that they must have knowledge, good knowledge, of both Halifax and Huddersfield. Mm. And in actual fact, there was uh, a sighting of the two men on a motorcycle in Huddersfield on the way to Halifax just prior to the robbery. Right. 
There are no descriptions, of course, from anyone in the jewellery shop because they had their helmets and visors on all the time. But there is some security video we can show and we can actually see the robbery taking place here. She's quite confused, but you can get some kind of idea of their description from that. Yes. Uh, it took place very quickly and obviously was very frightening to the witnesses, but both men are described as being about 5 foot 10 inches tall, stocky build, and both were wearing crash helmets with illegal dark visors. It's difficult to tell exactly what sort of clothes or indeed that shoulder bag is. But somebody did get a much better look at the driver at any rate in Cheapside as they made their getaway. How did he describe him? He describes him as a black man uh, with a black moustache and in his, a stocky build and in his mid-twenties. And uh, of course that might tie in quite nicely with the description you got from the man and the salesman in the showroom who really got a very good look at the men. That's right, the comparison is so similar that we feel that the men are one and the same. Uh, I.e. a black man, 5 foot 10 inches tall, a stocky build, with a black moustache to the side of his lips, um, with black short hair. Now what about the bike? That's quite distinctive, that bike. Yes, Q is a prefix uh, when the year of manufacture on an imported bicycle. On motorcycle. the Q plates there, yes, we can't see the Q plates, but that's, that, those Q plates are pretty rare, aren't they? That's right, and it's put on when the year of manufacture can't be determined. This is a red and white and blue Honda VFR 400 NC24 motorcycle. So that bike, those men and that Q, those Q plates might well identify them. And very briefly, the watches they stole. They're Rolex and Amiga watches of great value. Somebody somewhere must have had them either offered for sale mm. to them. If they have, please, could they contact us? If you recognise those, if you can help trace the two men, please do ring us. We're on 0500 600 600 here in the studio. Calls are free, remember, from anywhere in the UK. Or you can contact Mr Peel's colleagues direct at Halifax CID on another free number. That's 0800 454 0000. That's 0800 454 treble 0. Let me tell you, we've had very few calls so far on the Twos murders in Mid Glamorgan. An enormous number, all of these on the Darlington rape. Several names have come up, uh, one or two have repeated, but really this still isn't the particular thing that the police are hoping for. But the calls are coming in fast and furious on that one. On three of the four photo calls, I have to say, it looks very much as though they're going to be resolved quite quickly, and perhaps one of them tonight. And uh, if we've got any more news, well, we'll bring it as, as we uh, go on through the evening. And uh, don't forget the new number, and the lines are open until midnight on 0500 600 600. Detectives will be acting on the information as it comes in tonight, and we'll have, I hope, more news in about an hour and a half on Crime Watch Update at 11.45. If we're sounding a little incoherent at the moment, it's because some new news is coming in, so please do watch later. If you can't stay up to then, though, on behalf of victims of all the crimes we've covered, thank you for helping, thank you for watching, and above all, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.